So hello, welcome to the video and welcome to, yes you guessed it, Doha. I've just arrived in from Prague travelling on one of Qatar Airways narrow body A320 uh, jets. Attention please, this is a boarding number A6. I've just arrived in from Prague on one of Qatar Airways narrow body A320s and I have a few hours here before flying on to Abu Dhabi. Now this was a redemption booking paid for with Avios in business class. One of the peculiarities of travelling in this region is that Qatar doesn't offer a business class cabin on flights within the Gulf region. It's just economy or first class. One of those status prestige things that you see in various parts of the world. So when you make a business class redemption, you're booked into first class on the leg within the Gulf region. So what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean endless caviar and foot rubs, or at least I'm not expecting it to, but it does mean that you get access to the rather excellent Al Safwa Lounge here at Doha. It's often talked about as being one of the very best in the world. So in this video, I am going to review that flight down to Abu Dhabi, but it's only an hour long, and so it probably won't be a very interesting video, but I am gonna talk in a little bit more detail about the experience here in Doha, and also what the Al Safwa Lounge is actually like. So if that sounds good, stick around. Hi, I'm Matt. I've lived in five countries on four continents. I've flown over 1.4 million miles. I've visited over 100 countries, every American state, but I'm nowhere near done. So subscribe to the channel so you can come with me on my next trip. Ah, oh, the famous Doha Scary Bear. Cute for some, scary to most. If you go round the back of it, you can see the lamp thing actually goes through its body, which looks pretty scary to me. Plus, you can see its skin is solid fibreglass rather than cuddly fur. Anywho. The Al Safwa Lounge is quite close to the bear, although the signage throughout the terminal is terrible. There are staff milling around who will direct you if you get lost. The signage is for the Al Safwa rather than the first class lounge, so you do need to know the name you're looking for. The business lounge is called the Al Morjan, which may be worth remembering too. There's actually a second Al Morjan lounge now open in the garden end of the terminal. I spent some time there on the way back through Doha and we'll cover it in an upcoming video. Hello. A check at the bottom of the escalator and another at the top, along with a stamp on your boarding pass. I'm not going to talk over this next bit so you can get a sense of how it feels to enter this space. There's another welcome desk inside. There are a number of private rooms with beds and showers and I inquired whether one was available. Uh, none were. I was able to leave my rollerboard here though, which was handy. Then back through the central atrium towards the bar and restaurant. It's a vast, calming space. Some might say it's a little austere, but the sheer extravagance of the space really makes you feel like you're somewhere quite special. Through these doors is another huge space, which is still inside the terminal, but is open to the wider space below. They describe it as the tea area on their map, and although it was late afternoon when I visited, it was completely deserted. I can't imagine you'd ever struggle to find a free seat, or ten, in this lounge. 
Qatar says that the design of the lounge was inspired by the Museum of Islamic Art and there are some exhibits from there on display. That museum, indeed the whole city of Doha, is well worth a visit in my experience. I find the central historic part of Doha to be quite a bit more authentic than Dubai and Qatar Airways does make it quite easy to add a stopover if you're planning a trip through the region. The lounge also boasts a spa area with a jacuzzi and a relaxation space. Entry is free, although you will probably need to book a slot in that jacuzzi. Various spa treatments are additionally available for a fee, a quite a hefty fee actually. This is where those private nap rooms are located too. There's a games room with a racing simulator and various Xbox and PlayStation options. Everything was switched off when I was there, but this was about the only time during my stay when there wasn't an attendant within five feet of me, but I'm sure they would have sprung to life had I asked. There's even a room where your nanny can have a rest if you travel with one. There's even a duty-free shop within the lounge, extremely premium brands, and I didn't see any booze or fags, but I guess that's not what Qatar's first-class travellers are generally looking for. There's a secondary, less formal dining area at the other end of the lounge, they call it the deli dining space, but I'd suggest that the main bar and dining area is where you'd probably want to be. I started with a drink at the bar, and here's the first of two very minor criticisms I have of the lounge. The spirit selection isn't that premium. For example, they offer Bacardi and Captain Morgan rums, Jim Beam White Label bourbon and Jameson's Irish whiskey, all of which are pretty much entry-level spirits in their categories. I'd have hoped a first-class lounge could have done better. There were some better whiskies and bourbons, but Johnny Walker Gold Label is about as good as it gets, and I just think a lounge aiming to be the best in the world could do better. Laurent Perrier Champagne is poured, which is good stuff, but BA offers the Grand Siècle variants to its first-class passengers. Of course, it's part of the world where alcohol is haram, so we should probably be grateful that they offer alcohol at all. It's perhaps a harsh criticism, but it's something holding the lounge back in my eyes. I first visited this lounge in 2016, not long after it opened, and I recall being distinctly unimpressed with the food, but on this visit it was exceptional. I started with the lamb medallions, which were superb, and moved on to the Wagyu beef. Following viewer feedback on previous videos, I tend not to show myself eating on camera, but I had to here. It really was very, very good. My second criticism is again very picky, but you can buy access to this lounge if your ticket doesn't qualify you for access which isn't something you'd expect to be possible in the sort of super premium lounge the Al Safwa aspires to be. Or at least you could buy access. Qatar's website doesn't advertise that you can, and as I script this, I can't verify anywhere that you still can. Buying entry was a pragmatic revenue raising measure introduced during the you know what, so it was a decision that may one day, or indeed may already, have been reversed. And at 600 Qatari rials, which is about 165 US dollars, it's not cheap. But giving that option does diminish the exclusivity of the experience somewhat in my mind. A picky I know, but I'm struggling to offer anything more substantial in critiquing this space. Staffing numbers are high throughout the lounge and service is swift and efficient without being intrusive. It's an exceptional experience, even with my two tedious criticisms. They obviously have a problem with people oh. getting carried away and forgetting to leave for flights, so I was asked for my flight number three or four maybe times maybe so they could ensure that. I remembered to leave. And when it was time to leave, another perk of flying out of Doha in first class revealed itself. There's a departure area within the lounge through which you can get a bus to your gate. It's quite well hidden, not well advertised, and only works for onward connections in first class rather than in business. You can also access the Al Safwa if you fly into Doha in first and fly out in business. But if that's the case, you'll have to make your own way to the departure gates when it's time to go. A brief moment in the impressive Doha heat and onto the slightly bonkers first class bus. You almost expect there to be a bar on board. It was quite a drive around the terminal, but it certainly beat walking particularly as we departed from a remote stand, so we would have ended up taking a bus to get there anyway. 
we pulled up next to our four-year-old Boeing 737 MAX 8. That's the troubled and controversial 737 variant, which is probably now the safest aircraft in the world. It was originally purchased by Russian airline S7, but for obvious reasons was never delivered to them, so Qatar took possession of it only a few months earlier. And a clue as to how well the bus's air conditioning kept us cool as the abrupt jump into ambient Doha humidity fogs me up completely. And after a quick demisting of all my lenses, I was up and into this two row, eight seat, first class cabin, seat 2A for me. The usual blanket and pillow on the seat waiting for me. 40 inches of pitch, which isn't abundant, but it was perfectly adequate for this 40 minute flight no one next to me either. A tray table could be found in the left armrest, quite an elaborate mechanism actually. A decent sized table and I believe this gizmo is designed to prop up your phone or tablet. No screen in front of you, and you think it may be hiding here, but nope, this is a storage area, quite a handy one actually, with a plug and USB port down there as well. Overhead lights and an air vent, pretty much essential in this climate. A pre-departure refresher was offered, I chose some champagne and it hit the spot. A menu was handed out, remember this is a 40 minute flight. No wine menu though, so I'm not sure what the champagne was, but it had been Philipponat on other flights. Then some Arabic coffee was offered, with a date and a cold towel. More service items were given out before the door was even closed than you get on some entire flights in Europe. We took off on time into a dark and dusty Doha night. The views of the city can be spectacular after dark, but they weren't that night. My snack order had been taken before takeoff, and soon after the tray arrived. This was the chicken schnitzel sandwich, and very good it was too, and another glass of champagne. And almost immediately we were descending. One thing I've noticed before is that the further you get from Europe, the laxer air crews often are about locking down the cabin for landing. The couple in front of me wouldn't have got away with working on their laptops through landing on a European airline. Abu Dhabi Airport did honour us with a boarding finger directly into the terminal and I was quickly off towards what turned out to be a lengthy immigration queue. So to sum things up, the flight was great, they cram a lot into a 40 minute flight but it never felt rushed. But the hero of the video is the Al Safwa Lounge. It's an imposing, impressive space with high service standards and a great F&B offering, even taking into account my trivial criticisms. It's the sort of place you'd go out of your way to visit. I paid 45,000 avios plus around 180 quid to fly from Prague to Doha in business class, continuing on to Abu Dhabi in first, which is the combination of flights which gives you access to the Al Safwa in Doha. So is it the best lounge in the world? Well, it could be. There'll never be a consensus on which space holds that title and personal tastes need to be taken into account. For me, it's perhaps a little too formal. There's a layer of Middle Eastern traditionalism wrapped around an already somewhat austere environment, which makes it a little tough for a very informal Westerner like me to feel completely relaxed there. But it's a space you should experience if you can, and by adding a transfer in Doha to a routing to the Gulf region, it's not that hard to engineer yourself a visit and you will enjoy yourself if you can create a way of getting there. So thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed it. Please give the video a like if you did, subscribe if you're new, and leave me a comment. Are you now going to try and engineer a way to transit Doha? And if you'd like to support what I'm doing more directly, there is a Patreon account, the link to which is in the description below. So thanks again for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one. Goodbye.